Welcome everyone. This video is in response to the many globe propagandists who demand that I show a picture of the edge of the flat earth. For the dozens of these ball-loving zealots with multiple sock puppet accounts who repeat this mantra daily, your demand is ridiculous. But you probably already knew that, right? And that's why you probably keep demanding it. It's actually pretty funny that I just got one of these take a picture comments an hour ago. I'm going to prove in this video that independent travel is not allowed under the Antarctic Treaty system. That fact alone should cause any thinking person to begin questioning our official models. Because something big is being hidden from we, the plebeians, and we're not talking about penguins. For most flat earthers, based on the information that we can reasonably gather, Antarctica constitutes the outer rim of the known world. In other words, Antarctica is likely the shoreline to all of the world's oceans. Like a ring magnet, north constitutes the center of our flat earth map and south is every direction away from the northern center. And before I get a dozen comments claiming that such a magnet is impossible, here's a ring magnet shown here. Notice that south is in every direction away from the center north magnetic pole. This is where the 60th south parallel is on a Mercator map. This is the 60th south parallel on a potential flat earth azimuthal equidistant map. It seems that Antarctica constitutes the circular shore of the known world. So, demanding that I take a picture of a possible edge of the earth, if any, requires me to not only travel below the 60th south parallel, represented by the circle, but also to cross the entire breadth of Antarctica. According to official numbers, Antarctica has a diameter of roughly 3,400 miles, and so that means our trek will include a long boat ride for hundreds of miles below the 60th south parallel, plus a minimum 6,800 mile round trip hike across Antarctica. That's assuming the official model is correct. Maybe we could fly to one of the ceremonial pole areas, but that would still leave at least a 3,400 mile hike. In addition, we wouldn't know for sure whether the plane trip itself was interfering with our results, since the pilot would have to follow a designated path outlined by the Antarctic Treaty System, and who truly knows what direction that is until we get there. In order to be fully confident, we would really need to stick to the ground and have control over our own pathway, where we can control our direct southerly route opposite of the northern magnetic pole. Now whether Antarctica is a smaller continent next to the outer rim, or whether Antarctica is indeed the shoreline of the known world, I don't know the answer. Flat earthers don't have a government budget to spend a billion dollars to hire hundreds of cartographers and fleets of boats and planes to map the entire world. But even if flat earthers had the money, we would still run into the Antarctic problem which is the point of this video. So, what is the Antarctic problem? It is the fact that independent travel is not allowed below the 60th south parallel in any reasonable manner to make any determination as to whether Antarctica is the shoreline boundary circumscribing the known world or whether Antarctica is simply a continent a little north of the true but unnamed southerly shoreline of the Earth's oceans. For all we know, Antarctica may be an infinite plain that is uninhabitable at further distances. Again, we don't know. But, as I will describe in this video, I suspect that Antarctica is the shoreline circumscribing the known world due to the unbelievable restrictions placed on travel there. Excluding a couple of questionable claims, the total lack of north-south circumnavigation only proves the same. But if I'm not allowed by our governments to independently travel below the 60th South Parallel and then to traverse Antarctica over 6,800 miles, then I cannot take a picture of a theoretical edge, dome, or those other lands beyond the South Pole, whatever the case may be. But you probably don't quite grasp how much area is really being blocked off under the Antarctic Treaty System. Let's look at it from the alleged 60th North Parallel because this will give you an idea of the tremendous area blocked off to independent exploration. This is the area of the 60th North Parallels. 
As you can see, the 60th North Parallel includes all of northern Canada, Alaska, much of Russia, including St. Petersburg and other major cities, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Greenland. It is huge. Now, why in the world is this much area blocked off at the south? Do you really think it's because of penguins? You see, first there was just one, now there's thousands of them. Are they trying to tell us something? So what's the problem? Well, among other things, we are messing with their food chain. And we have got to do something about it. We should just abandon all marine harvesting. Uh, Do you think the child propaganda from Happy Feet is true? The Antarctic Treaty was executed in 1959 and has been in place ever since. Think about it. No country had any real alleged concerns about the environment at that time. One of the more interesting facts is that the Soviet Union also ratified the treaty and did so from the beginning on December 1st, 1959. Do you really think the Soviets were truly concerned about the penguins and the fragile Antarctic environment? In other words, America, the USSR, and the rest of the major countries of the world remained partners in generally closing Antarctica throughout most of the so-called fake space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the fake moon landings, most of the Cold War, the Vietnam War, the Six-Day War, the Soviet-Afghan War, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, which at that time Russia continued as a signatory in 1992. That's some peculiar cooperation transcending international conflicts, don't you think? Do you really think that the vast resources and strategic military benefits of Antarctica were multilaterally put aside because of penguins? Even North Korea has been a signatory since 1987. For some strange reason, the Antarctic Treaty has remained sacrosanct for nearly 60 years, regardless of worldwide conflicts. For the reasonable, objective person, alarm bells should be going off right now. As I was preparing this video, I found something else that's interesting. Out of all the flags of all the countries across the Earth, can you guess which one only shows a map of the country as the emblem of the country? You guessed it! Only one. Antarctica. Yeah, the one country they want you to know the shape of. That doesn't reek of programming, does it? Let me make this clear from the beginning. Travel to Antarctica is more difficult than travel to a military base. Sure, the military base may have a visitor shop near the entrance, but if you go beyond that visitor shop or another designated travel area without clearance, you're going to get arrested, or something worse. I'm sure I already have a few globe shields ready to pounce, armed with various inanities to counter my statement, but let's ignore the global spin. This video is about evidence and facts and the reasonable assumptions based thereon. So let's decide to take a theoretical trip across Antarctica to find the edge, if any. I'm not talking about going to the visitor center along the edge of Antarctica, or an overly expensive cruise to a small ice shelf along the edge with a small excursion, or a flight to one of the several multiple ceremonial poles, and then straight back again. Yeah, that's not strange at all. I must reiterate, because I will get a dozen comments telling me to take a cruise or that someone's best friend went to Antarctica, I am not talking about a trip to one of the few designated tourist locations of Antarctica. I'm talking about a real trek pointed directly south across the entire 3,400 mile breadth of Antarctica and back again to, to determine whether Antarctica circumscribes the known world and to, to possibly determine whether there's an edge, a dome, or whatever, and then take a picture of it. I'm talking about repeating the trek of Admiral Byrd and discovering that area as big as the United States that has never been seen by a human being on the other side of the South Pole, full of minerals and such just waiting to be explored. But strangely enough, there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. Okay, let's get started with our theoretical trip. So what is required to track across the entire breadth of Antarctica? Now, I'm in the United States and so we're going to examine it from the position of a slave of the U.S. But the rules are 
going to be the same for all 53 signatory countries of the Antarctic Treaty, and everyone else since these countries all enforce the same provisions. To begin with, we need to understand that anything below the 60th South Parallel is referred to as the Antarctic Treaty Area. What does that mean? That d means I'm generally not allowed within hundreds of miles of Antarctica, from approximately 400 to 900 miles, without obtaining a permit to do so. Now, the U.S. government has recorded that some sailors have seen the mountain ranges of Antarctica at 300 miles distance while sailing. Of course, 300 miles should be impossible on the globe with a curvature drop of 11.4 miles, but the 60th parallel is between 400 and 900 miles away from the shoreline of Antarctica. Even under a flat Earth, that's a lot of lower atmosphere to see through, also referred to as at atmospheric extinction factor, and a lot of angular size reduction. Despite the claims of the ignorant globe zealots, you can't see through that much lower atmosphere. In other words, I can't even see Antarctica from the ocean without first obtaining a permit from the U.S. State Department, or whatever department that controls that in your country. Taking a trip to the 60th South Parallel isn't going to accomplish anything, and so we're stuck with getting a government permit. So let's go through the steps to obtaining a permit from the U.S. State Department. This is the handbook of the Antarctic Treaty System. These are the rules that govern all signatories to the treaty. We'll be citing to it regularly as it lays down the rules that govern the Antarctic Treaty beyond the fluff of the treaty language itself. Most importantly, we're going to look at the rules governing non-governmental activities located here, and some of the rules regarding the protection of the environment located here. Now, as a U.S. slave, this is the first form you'll have to submit to get approved to travel to Antarctica. The form itself seems rather innocuous until you understand exactly what is involved in the application process. In summary, Antarctica is treated as a giant natural reserve. Like a military base, all activities and pathways in Antarctica must be approved. This is unlike any other area in the world, except maybe a place like North Korea. So, when I say that no independent travel is allowed below the 60th South Parallel, I'm stating an admitted fact well recorded as international law. The protocol states, as a matter of principle, that all activities are to be planned and conducted on the basis of information sufficient to evaluate their possible impact on the Antarctic environment and its associated ecosystems, and on the value of Antarctica for the conduct of scientific research. Organizers should be aware that the environmental protocol requires that activities shall be modified, suspended, or canceled if they result or threaten to result in impacts upon the Antarctic environment or dependent or associated ecosystems. If you visit Russia with a Russian visa, for example, are you limited to one particular neighborhood and certain pathways? For those who visit America as a tourist, are you restricted to New York City? Or are you generally allowed to travel around America? No one is just allowed to travel around Antarctica. All of your activities, vehicles, and pathways must be approved, but it gets much worse. Now, how many genuine people watching this video think that the purpose of seeing the edge, the dome, or the extended plain beyond Antarctica would be approved by the U.S. State Department and the other myriad of agencies? Are you ready to litigate the matter when some State Department official arbitrarily says something like, I think your expedition is frivolous and would be too damaging to the environment, especially in the light of the frivolity of the expedition? I don't think a court will overturn that decision, especially when treaty law supersedes any rights you may think you have. So we're going to have to come up with some fake expedition that will somehow get approved. Let's say we're a tree-hugging Luciferian geologist conducting a comprehensive analysis of the global carbon footprint on Antarctica and its flora and fauna. I think that sounds plausible and so we could hypothetically fake our way in with respect to our purpose, but it will be tricky. Okay, I'm not advocating that anyone break the law, this is all theoretical. That brings us to the next point. Entire swaths of land are entirely off limits to all travel. These are called specially protected areas. It's pretty much guaranteed that no one is going to get a permit to go through a specially protected area. 
If my math is right, that's 1,373 square miles that are allegedly specially protected areas. You can see the maps on the websites, but I don't have time to plot all of them. Now I agree, that's not huge in comparison to the total alleged area of Antarctica. But I believe there's a distinct possibility that those swaths of land could be coordinated in such a way as to prevent me from going through Antarctica easily. So right from the beginning my route may be extra hard. Especially if mountain pathways are blocked and the areas are much larger than claimed due to likely globe distance sh shenanigans. But let's go ahead and assume we can navigate around those prohibited, specially protected areas. Next, no motorized equipment is allowed at all for non-governmental personnel. Page 308 states, Do not use aircraft, vessels, small boats, or other means of transport in ways that disturb wildlife either at sea or on land. Hmm. That seems kind of hard, and very subjective, doesn't it? Antarctica itself is supposed to have a diameter of 3,400 miles. That means no motorized equipment for at least a 6,800 mile round trip? That sounds pretty damn impossible, right? Especially if Antarctica is much bigger than what is claimed. What about sled dogs? Surely they'll be allowed. What's that? Sled dogs aren't even allowed? Okay, so our trip is now limited to a very long hike in insanely harsh conditions over an extreme rise of elevation. On a side note, Antarctica has the highest average elevation of any alleged continent, but I'm sure that's just coincidence, right? But getting back to our insane trip, we not only have to walk at least 6,800 miles, mostly depending on when we need to turn around, we must also tread extremely lightly as walking on plants in Antarctica is prohibited. I can't damage plants or frighten wildlife on a 6,800 mile journey in a wilderness? I wonder if the Lewis and Clark expedition was limited by such requirements. Good luck traversing 6,800 miles on foot without damaging plants or frightening wildlife with no motorized equipment. I'm not saying that we couldn't figure out a way to get around these big issues, or maybe we could just you know, theor theoretically ignore the issues once we get there, but again, I'm not advocating that anyone break the law. I'm saying that these are listed enforcement rules under the Antarctic Treaty system, and so think of how easy it would be for one of the many international bureaucrats reviewing our application to deny a permit to track across Antarctica based on this one plausible excuse. Sorry, you're going to end up walking on plants and scaring birds at least one time during your 6,800 mile journey and the Antarctic Treaty System prohibits such activities. Application denied. For argument's sake, let's just assume we're going to figure out a way to get around that. Don't ask me how. The next issue is how are we going to carry all that food and fuel for heat? And don't think that the Antarctic Treaty System isn't concerned with how we store our fuel. The United States itself is roughly 2,500 miles across. So imagine the difficulty of hauling food, climbing at extremely high and unknown elevations, and carrying all of your extremely warm gear and supplies across the United States from coast to coast and back again, all on foot with no food stops along the way. And don't forget, we're going to have to haul our poop as well. You are going to have to drag your poop with you on your 6,800 mile Antarctic hike. But it gets worse. Your poop is regulated by a different pseudo-government agency than National Science Foundation. Here's where you can learn about what permit is required if you wanted to dispose of your poop on your 6,800 mile journey if you don't want to carry it. Could you imagine for your next trip to France and the custom agent saying, Welcome to France. By the way, no vehicles are allowed, no animals are allowed, do not walk on any plants, and here's a bag for your poop. Be sure to bring it back full. If you don't want to carry your poop, you're going to have to get a permit from the National Science Foundation. Enjoy your stay. But here's another and potentially bigger problem. What if there is no edge when you get there, but the conditions only get worse? How many years of supplies can one carry by a handheld sled and some skis? What if Antarctica goes beyond 3,400 miles? What then? When do you turn your back and how do you prove it because the Globe Shills are just going to call you a liar anyways? 
Any sane person right now would have to admit that our little trip is impossible, but we have a lot of paid for apologists for our slave masters who will still somehow claim that I'm lying when I say that independent travel in Antarctica is prohibited. But we're not done. Going back to our form DS4131. In addition to disclosure to other parties to the treaty, the information provided may be shared with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to ensure compliance with 40 CFR Part 8 Environmental Impact Assessment of Non-Governmental Activities in Antarctica, as well as with other relevant U.S. agencies. This brings us to one of the most important issues facing us. What is an environmental impact assessment? No country, even North Korea, would ever require an environmental assessment before traveling across their country. It's insane. Here's the definition of an environmental impacts assessment in the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. Environmental impact assessment means the environmental review process required by the provisions of this part and by Annex 1 of the protocol and includes preparation by the operator and U.S. government review of an environmental document and public access to and circulation of environmental documents to other parties and the Committee of on Environmental Protection as required by Annex 1 of the protocol. Well, let's see what the Inv Committee for Environmental Protection says. Article 8 of the protocol requires the parties to conduct environmental impact assessments for the Antarctic activities and provides three levels of assessment according to the potential impacts of each activity. The procedures for environmental impact assessment are detailed in Annex 1 of the protocol. If a proposed activity is determined in a preliminary stage of assessment to have less than a minor or transitory impact, it may proceed. If an activity is determined as likely to have a minor or transitory impact, then an initial environmental evaluation must be prepared. If an initial environmental evaluation indicates the potential for more than a minor or transitory impact, or if such impact is otherwise determined to be likely, a comprehensive environmental evaluation must be prepared. Draft CEEs are made publicly available and considered by the CEP, which then advises the ATC ATCM, and that's a Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, Comments provided by other parties in the ATCM must be addressed in a final CE, which is used as a basis for making decision about whether and how the activity is conducted. Same law as here. It is the comprehensive environmental evaluation that's going to kill our expedition. Here's the regulation, and this applies to all signatories, including North Korea. Any operator who plans a non-governmental expedition that would require a CEE must submit a draft of the CEE by December 1st of the preceding year. Within 15 days of receipt of the draft CEE, EPA will send it to the Department of State, which will circulate it to all parties to the protocol, and forward it to the Committee for Environmental Protection established by the protocol, and publish notice of receipt of the CEE and request for comments on the CEE in the Federal Register and will provide copies to any person upon request. The EPA will accept public comments on the CEE for a period of 90 days following notice to the Federal notice in the Federal Register, the EPA, in consultation with other interested federal agencies, will evaluate the CEE to determine if the CEE meets the requirements under Article 8, Annex 1 to the protocol and the provisions of this part and will transmit its comments to the operator within 120 days following publication in the Federal Register at the notice of availability of the CEE. <laughs> so now I'm sure most of you probably just went brain dead when I read that. So let me explain it. First, our CEE, that's our Comprehensive Environmental Evaluation, must pass the EPA's initial review. Not an easy task. Next, the Department of State, along with its Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs Bureau of Oceans, Environment and Science, must review it. Next, it will be sent to all parties. That's 100 countries, by the way. Next, your assessment must be approved by an international bureaucracy called the Committee for Environmental Protection. After their highly unlikely approval, the EPA will then publish it in the United States Federal Register. Now, why would they do that? Because any supposed private tree-hugging group can now sue to stop you from going there. Once that is done, assuming you haven't been sued, then the EPA, along with all of the other interested federal agency, whatever the hell that means, evaluates it again. Do you realize the amount of legal work this would entail? Do you realize how easy it would be for any one of hundreds of entities or thousands of bureaucrats to halt your expedition? Again, this applies to all countries. One person in the comments of my last Antarctic video claimed that it wasn't necessary in the United Kingdom. Well, he lied. The Environmental or Madrid 
protocol is part of the Antarctic Treaty system and applies to all countries. Here is the requirement on the UK application if you're interested. As explained above, for every person in the United States who wants to get a permit to travel across Antarctica has to first submit the environmental impact assessment to the EPA. You know, the freedom-loving EPA. Time is short. EPA! 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 Believe me! Believe me! Thanks for listening. You lost them, sir. Damn it! Well, then you find them, and you get them back in the dome. And to make sure nobody else gets out, I want roving death squads around the perimeter 24-7. Do you know what the environmental impact statement costs? This is very similar. A typical environmental impact statement costs from $250,000 to $2 million. And those are a lot easier than this comprehensive environmental analysis required under the Antarctic Treaty. For us... The biggest problem is that you would have to incur the expense of the environmental impact assessment before you know if you're denied due to whatever arbitrary claim a bureaucrat can think of. Do you see how difficult this environmental assessment will be? How would one know the environmental impact on an area which you've never been to and very little information would be available? With a normal environmental assessment, You'd be able to send an engineering firm to the location to make the assessment with attorneys who would draft the statement. In this case, you can't send an engineering firm all the way to Antarctica, and so you have to hire Antarctic experts who have been to the same places you're planning on walking through. Now, how many of those do you think there are? I say that we can safely assume that the price of getting an environmental impacts assessment approved by the EPA and the international agency would cost millions. Assuming no supposed private group sues you once, you once it's published in the Federal Register. Do you have more than $2 million to spend for an environmental impact assessment? And then, what if the EPA or the Committee for Environmental Protection or one of the other agencies says no? Maybe that not enough information was provided. Are you ready to spend another $2 million to fight that in court? But you still have to have your purpose approved. Do you see the problem there? You would likely spend millions on getting the environmental impact statement only later to have some official at the International Committee for Environmental Protection reject your purpose in Antarctica. You would truly gamble millions in this silly endeavor. To learn more about the environmental assessment procedures with the Committee for Environmental Protection, you can research it here. See also. Let's get to the final issue we're going to run into. Seven countries claim territorial rights to various parts of Antarctica. Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom all maintain territorial claims in Antarctica. I did find it interesting that the USSR never claimed territorial rights to Antarctica. Yeah. I'm willing to bet that my trip across Antarctica is going to need other permits from other countries based only on territorial claims. Getting more permits or visas from other countries who have alleged territory in Antarctica? Yeah, that shouldn't add too much to our already strained budget. Now, just for the propagandist who's going to claim that's not true, I quote, The Antarctic Treaty puts aside the potential for conflict over sovereignty for providing that nothing that occurs while the treaty is enforced will enhance or diminish territorial claims. Meaning, the territorial claims trump. So, the next dumb shill who demands that you take a picture of the edge or that anyone can go to Antarctica and see for themselves that it's a continent, be sure to point out what a damn idiot they are, and then share this video because everything in here is fact that anyone can look up, and I'll try to have all the links in the description. Of course, the lying minions from the Ministry of Truth will spin and call you names, but at least the rest of the world will see the liars for who they truly are. This is Taboo Conspiracy, signing off. In case I don't see ya. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> yeah.